We're talking to uh, Jack Coton. Uh, <clears throat> Jack's a retired senior vice president of public relations of uh, the Ameritech company, which uh, uh, was absorbed into what is, uh, became SBC, which is now, if you haven't seen the TV commercials, <laughs> is now AT&T. Uh, <clears throat> Jack and I uh, uh, shared an experience uh, 25 years ago uh, when the AT&T and the Justice Department of the United States settled an antitrust suit that effectively broke up the Bell telephone system, and uh, which is where Ameritech uh, came yeah. from. It was the Midwest uh, piece of that breakup. And I, I wanted to talk to Jack about, uh, I saw, my recollections of that were from the AT&T point of view, where, where we were, in effect, uh, had devised the, the announcement plan but Jack was in the telephone business side of it, and uh, it would be interesting to me, and I hope to everybody else, to get his recollections and whatever lessons uh, he may remember from that, because uh, uh, AT&T was sort of the top of the pyramid. It was the holding company uh, that owned uh, all of the Bell telephone companies. But the fact of the matter, the employees, for the most part, uh, a million of them, were mainly employees of the telephone companies, and the customers were customers of the Bell Telephone Companies, not AT&T. So Jack saw that uh, event, to put it politely, uh, <laughs> unfold uh, from a different perspective than I did. And uh, Jack, talk to us about that. What happened? Well, I, I would tell you, it's a very good question. and. Uh, actually uh, came somewhat as a shock to us even though the trial had gone along or the negotiations had gone along for some time. But when the word was finally uh, released that the uh, breakup of the Bell system was going to uh, t actually take place on uh, January 1st of 1984, it really came as a shock, I think, to employees and particularly to employees in the operating companies. The company I was involved with at the time was Illinois Bell, which was designated to be one of the five Bell companies which were going to become part of the Midwestern uh, company. There were seven companies, operating companies, that were created from what became 9X in the East, Bell South in the South, Southwestern Bell, U.S. West, and Pacific Tel, but we were located in, in the heartland. And our company was composed of the operating companies in Wisconsin, Michigan, Ohio, Indiana, and Illinois. And I, I would say that the very first sense, besides the shock of it, was a sense of divorce, like there was an enormous divorce in the family. I mean, we could not believe that something like this was going to happen. AT&T had been uh, providing cover for us for uh, years. We felt very much a part of the Bell system and part of the Bell family. Uh, in fact, the entire Bell system was regarded by most of the million employees that you cited as a large family. We were all dedicated to providing service to our customers, to meeting their needs, and to doing uh, community uh, service type things, and it was an extraordinary work experience. So the fact that this company was going to be severed from AT&T was a uh, at the outset was, uh, was, was quite, a, quite a shock and uh, employees were, uh, I would say at the outset, sort of dazed. They were uh, disappointed. They were mad at the government. They were mad at the FCC. They were mad at mad the Justice Department. Mad at AT&T. And <laughs> mad most at at and for allowing such a thing. How, you know, how could this actually happen? I mean, who in their right mind would break up the world's largest company even though it was a monopoly, but a company that people liked that provided good service, that provided good service at low rates. It just seemed incomprehensible to those of us who were on the street, so to speak, and working out in, in, the, in the heartland. So uh, when we uh, recovered from that, then the question became, well, what do we do about it? What do we do now? <laughs> right. And the, uh, thing that really took place was uh, all of a sudden this creation of a will to, by God, if we were going to be separated from the Bell system, 
that we were going to become the best of the operating companies and provide the best service and try to have the best relations that we could have with uh, customers and the uh, commissions. Well, that bit of bravado was much easier said than done because one of the first things that I, I wound up uh, having the responsibility for was picking out a name for the new company. And that I created, of course, as one always does, a, 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 a small committee made up of representatives of the five companies and, and a few other people. And we hired our ad agency and then uh, consultants to help us with this project. And of course, everybody had a different idea about what our name should be. And the key thing that became important to us, we had been Illinois Bell Company, we had been Wisconsin Bell, Michigan Bell, Indiana Bell, Ohio Bell. Would we keep the name Bell as part of our new name? That which became, you were entitled to do. <laughs> which we were entitled yeah. to do, and some of the companies did. But in our situation, that became, not only was it controversial, but it was decided that we we were going to be separated. We didn't want to have anything to do with what had gone on in the past. So we were going to become a separate entity, and that we were going to show the others how this we could make this work and work to our, our advantage. Well. So there were those who held out for being Midwest Bell. Some, of course, wanted to keep the Bell name, called Midwest Bell, Great Lakes Bell. There were different combinations of names that were uh, actually brought forth and suggested to us. But one of the things that we kind of claimed immediately, we started doing research on what names would be most acceptable and forward-looking, because we wanted to be a forward-looking company. And our research showed us that the words that signified in the telecommunications industry, progress and future and being innovated, words like information and technologies led the, led the way. So we decided if we could create a name that had information and technologies in it, that that would be to our advantage. And then looking at the lineup of companies, uh, one of the few suggestions that I made that seemed to get universal approval immediately was that we ought to have the word American be our first, because if we were American, we would be the first in the alphabetical order of all the companies, including AT&T, if they chose to continue to be American Telephone Telegraph Company. So in short order, we adapted the name of American Information Technologies Company, and that became our name. The trick then became, if that's the name, where all does that have to appear? Stock certificates, for example. We were going to have entirely a new stock issue, and so all of our certificates had to be uh, printed and made, and we had to use the name. And what do we pick as a symbol to put on the certificate? Because every certificate has a three-dimensional image, so to speak. And after much discussion, we decided to use the, the goddess god, Mercury. <coughs> And we'd use that. Well, there was controversy because Mercury was, and we're in the Midwest, of course, Mercury was always half nude. And that bothered some of the people <laughs> that we <Mercury> had. Also, <laughs> also slippery. <laughs> Very slippery, but nevertheless, that all uh, turned out okay. And we decided, well, what color do you want the stock certificates printed? Well, you could have them brown or red or whatever. And, of course, our treasurer immediately said, well, they have to be printed in green because green signifies money. So anyway, that's one of those things that happened in that area. But that just was one of the byproduct type of things that happened. Uh, immediately, we needed to develop an advertising and branding type campaign that suggested that we now no longer were Illinois Bell and Ohio Bell, et cetera, that we were American Information Technologies. Our stock uh, ticker symbol was going to be AIT, and that became very popular immediately, and we started using that in some of the employee information. But the trick was to begin to tell our employees that we were still in the business of providing customer service. We still were regulated by the state commissions, only now that we had the FCC also providing oversight. Our playground shifted from just being Illinois or Indiana or Michigan 
now to Washington, so we had a much bigger arena that we had to adapt to and adapt to. And uh, my boss suggested that in addition now to worrying about what was going on in Springfield, which had been my main uh, government relations thing, that I ought to start beginning to worry about what was going on in Washington as well because we needed to have a Washington office. So as a result, our lives began to change dramatically. Uh, but, the, the, but the key thing was our, our employees. The employees were the most reluctant to give up the past and enter the future. There were the ones that wanted to, yeah, let's go out and really show them that we can do this. But more and more, there was a, you know, let's talk about the good old days when we were part of the Bell system and we were part of Ma Bell and all of that. And there was some sense that when we started to repaint the trucks from with Illinois Bell and having the Bell symbol on it, with uh, Ameritech as the name, that there were p people that were not enthusiastic about that. One of the things that I wound up having to do was come up with a graphic design for the, how we were going to display the name Ameritech, and then that meant choosing the colors. Uh, we had a superior, uh, Ladislav Sutner was a graphic designer, internationally known, came up with a beautiful logo and forward-looking symbol, which we put on the stock certificate and used in our advertising and all that. But the color that we chose to use was brown. And we picked brown because it was distinctive, it was a distinctive color. Everybody else had been used to Bell System Blue or some combination of that, and so we wanted to be different. So we had brown, and, and there were people in the officer group that questioned me on why would we ever want to use a color like brown, and I had to suggest to them that there were thousands of trucks running around the country with brown oh, UPS, UPS. Yeah. and that it wasn't that we were introducing brown as a color. And I also reminded them that most people's favorite sweetness was chocolate, and chocolate was brown, and so that we would be <laughs> in good company. Now, I have to admit, those were sort of limp <coughs> reasons for doing that, but in the final analysis, it, is, it began to, to take, and the people began to accept that as being, yeah, this is who we are. Transfer their allegiance. Right. But I'm gonna take you back to the, the human part of it, the breakup, because right. um, this is a story I don't know. Um, a couple of things happened. Uh, first of all, they're no longer Bell System employees, uh, they must have wondered where did my pension go, uh, was the kind of thing that might have come up, I don't know. Also in the, the uh, terms of the breakup, there, there was one stinker business, as you may recall, which was who sells or leases the telephones, because there was a dead last loser, <laughs> you could not make money. And uh, in their wisdom, the Justice Department and the judge decided that was AT&T's business. Right. So you had many employees who were installers, or did right. repair work, so on and so forth. They were in limbo. Uh, they weren't gonna work for you anymore. They had to become right. AT&T employees or do something else. Uh, and of course you had customers, uh, I, I remember, <laughs> where I was, uh, uh, one of the television journalists uh, uh, entrapped me in an interview <laughs> on the air by handing me three telephones, <laughs> which he had disconnected from his apartment, he said, and handed them back to me and said, now what do I do? <laughs> so what, you know, what happened to the customers and the employees in that, in that it was a cultural shock for, for all of them, at least those who, who cared. Well, it was a big cultural shock for the customers about the, and confusion about the telephone yeah. instrument How itself and the that? connection. And we did our best with, uh, with what I would call customer uh, information pieces that were direct mail, we used advertising, we used uh, letters directly to the customers, trying to explain the difference. But I have to, admit that uh, the job was long and arduous to get people to really understand that we provided the service up to a certain point and then the uh, inside wiring was either on their own or that we would do it for a, a special fee. It was no longer 
uh, the, from the f where the phone instrument was, whatever instrument they might have, back to the central office, that that had been separated. And that was a point of great dissatisfaction as far as uh, customers were concerned. Customers were confused about who to call, for what, for whether it was repair service, and if it was repair, they'd be asked, well, where is it? You know, I don't know where my phone, the phone's dead. You know, I don't know whether it's outside or inside or what, you know. And uh, that was, uh, that I, I, I'd say as hard as we tried in all uh, the states to, to overcome that, that experience ultimately turned out to be the best teacher as far as the uh, customers. After you've had a few run-ins here and there, that is a bit of a problem. The fact that customers got two bills now instead of one bill because uh, long-distance services were provided by a different uh, uh, you know, supplier, uh, all of that uh, is made Time and time again, when you go to a party or a meeting or whatever, you say, the breakup of the bell system is the stupidest thing that the government has ever done. And then why did you let it happen? It was always our fault. It was like something that, gee, you know, we just said, oh, yeah, go ahead, break us up. We don't care anytime. And time and time again, that required, you know, kind of patience and, and being calm, <laughs> relatively speaking, to respond to some people who were quite irate. In the meantime, the employees, particularly the contact employees, whether they were the service the reps in the business office, the they had to deal with the customers, just like the uh, installers and repairmen who went out. And we equipped all of them with uh, little, what I was going to call cheat sheets, but uh, I don't, that's the wrong <laughs> term <laughs> to use here, but, but with information pieces, points which stress, give the I points. Think we'd call them yeah, PR. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, key uh, talking points yeah. about what to, how to respond to these questions. And I would say that the majority of employees handled that pretty well, but as you, uh, well, no, not all employees are gifted with the ability to respond to uh, people, particularly irate customers. If, yeah. if the customer was friendly and nice in one way, usually that went pretty well. But if the employee was met head on, either over the phone or face to face, uh, those situations uh, caused concern for us. Uh, we had a halo effect immediately after the breakup in 84 and 85 where we had uh, the Ma Bell influence carried over, which we benefited from. And then as customer experience multiplied, uh, customer attitudes towards the service we were providing dropped. And all of that then required a regeneration of, uh, of ability and of course, in our company, as, as you well know, in the Bell system, the public relations departments handled the customer information job. They were responsible for the advertising, they went to, for the directory introductory pages. Everything that was explained to customers as well as employees funneled through our department. And I, I would have to say that our, our public relations people in the departments understood this, they were willing to give of their time and energy and work uh, extraordinary amounts of time to try to fix these things, but it was so pervasive that uh, it just didn't never seem to go away. Our advertising agencies and the firms that we hired to help us with the customer information, they all worked diligently, but it was uh, a time factor that finally began to work in our advantage. When we would go to meet with state legislatures or <laughs> and meet with the Congress, I remember meeting with you know representatives of various delegations in Washington of our congressmen, and they all they're there in Washington. They had every opportunity to put their finger in the dike, but do we see much? finger in the dike sort of thing. Yeah. They're down there saying, I'm getting nothing but complaints back in my district about what you're, what you're doing. Like, we should have actually tried to do something about it. And the fact is that it was, uh, it was, a, it was a long pull. Now, I, from your perspective, you're dealing with a whole different uh, scene, but we felt that we were on the, you know, we were in the field, 
we were in the front lines and the, uh, the best thing that we could do is uh, try to do our very best and, and not let uh, the negative publicity that we got or comments, whether it was on television or, or whatever, really begin to uh, get us down. And slowly, that all began to uh, turn around. I'd like to say that it was directly uh, because of our efforts, but it really was because of the efforts of really about 100,000 employees. Like when we were created, we were the 30th largest company. I mean, nobody really appreciated how big AT&T was. We came out as the 30th largest company in the, in the United States. And uh, it, it, uh, there's, there were a lot of customers, a lot of employees involved. Yeah. One of the things before we go to the next question that I just wanted to chip in is, and thank you because this is stuff that I was not happily <laughs> involved in, but, but the judge gave us uh, 18 months to, from the time we agree, agreed to the, to the settlement in order to ex actually operate separately. So you had your employees and our own in limbo, not the whole 18 months, but a lot of the part of the time, they, many didn't know which side of the dividing line they, they were going to land on or were they going to go to work for AT&T, did they stay with Ma Bell. Uh, they had angry customers, uh, <laughs> they were angry. <laughs> and uh, I think what probably did pull the whole outfit through all of us is that I, I used to say that the old Ma Bell was one-third business one third family and one third religion, and uh, and it was a terrible shock. But I believe that attitude uh, that service is our business. Uh, many customers not might not necessarily believe that every day, but but service was our business, and so we we're going to get through this uh, this mess and. Uh, Come out the other the other side. And the, the other thing is that it's a it's a high uh, irony in terms of how government works in a democracy because it was 25 years ago more or less that this happened, and the whole darn thing has been put back together with the consent of the same Justice Department. So several hundred thousand employees uh, went on the. Batan death march. <laughs> Several tens of thousands of them lost their jobs and their careers altogether. Um, well, as you un un unknown amounts of marketing money was spent, <laughs> as you as you just described, to explain we're Ameritech and we're here to serve you. And it wasn't very long that you're AT and T again. <laughs> again, so.